the answer to that, do we not? Mutineers. Pirates have often been portrayed in a glamorous light on screen, but the reality of their actions during the golden age of piracy can be far more fascinating and brutal. Many infamous pirates plundered and murdered their way through the New World, sometimes even with the tacit approval of their governments. From heart-eating psychopaths to gentlemen with a penchant for bizarre methods of torture, here are our picks for five of the most feared and notorious pirates to have ever sailed the seas. Number 5. Edward Lowe Let's start with the story of the pirate named Edward Ned Lowe, also known as Lowe or Lowe. He lived during the Golden Age of Piracy, which was in the early 18th century. Now, Ned Lowe wasn't your ordinary pirate. He had a pretty rough start in life, being born into poverty in Westminster, London. As a young boy, he already had a knack for thievery. But things took a turn when he decided to move to Boston, Massachusetts. Unfortunately, tragedy struck when his wife passed away while giving birth in the year 1719. Devastated by this loss, Ned found himself seeking a different path in life. And that's when he became a pirate. Ned Lowe set sail on the vast seas, operating along the coasts of New England, the Azores, and even in the Caribbean. He wasn't just an ordinary pirate, though. He was a fierce and ruthless one. Leading a small fleet of three or four ships, Ned and his crew captured over a hundred ships during his short but eventful career. Can you believe that? And to make matters worse, he didn't just take the ships and their treasures. No, he had a more sinister plan. Ned Lowe was infamous for his violent and cruel ways. He didn't just take prisoners, he tortured them before mercilessly ending their lives. It's no wonder he gained a reputation as one of the most vicious pirates of his time. Even though he was active for only three years, his name still strikes fear into the hearts of sailors. When we return from Carolina, every man in this ship will have his hat filled with gold. What happens after that? It's an uncertain world, Mr. Meeks. Dating back to the days after their death, Ned Lowe found himself working as an honest rigger, but fate had something different in store for him. In the early months of 1722, he joined a group of 12 men on a sloop bound for Honduras. They planned to gather logs and sell them in Boston for a profit. It seemed like a straightforward venture, but little did they know that their journey would take a treacherous turn. During the voyage, Lowe held the position of a patron, overseeing the loading and transportation of the logs. One fateful day, he returned to the ship feeling famished, hoping to satisfy his hunger. However, the captain had other plans. He informed Lowe and his comrades that they would have to wait to eat, and their only sustenance would be a ration of rum. This decision did not sit well with Lowe. Driven by hunger and frustration, Lowe's emotions got the better of him. In a fit of anger, he grabbed a loaded musket and aimed it at the captain. His intention was clear, to shoot and take revenge. But alas, his shot missed its mark and instead struck another unfortunate crew member, piercing through the poor fellow's throat. The mutiny had failed, and Lowe and his friends were swiftly expelled from the ship, left to fend for themselves. However, this setback didn't dampen Lowe's spirit. Just a day later, he took charge of the 12-man gang, including a man named Francis Farrington Spriggs, who would later earn his notorious reputation as a pirate. Together, they seized control of a small sloop near the shores of Rhode Island. In the process, they ended the life of one man, solidifying their decision to become pirates. Their resolve was clear. They would sail under a black flag, declaring war against the entire world. And so, a new chapter in Ned Lowe's life began, filled with daring exploits, treacherous seas, and the pursuit of riches. Little did he know that his name would echo through history as one of the fiercest and most feared pirates of his time. In a remarkable raid on June 1722, the notorious pirate Lowe and his crew targeted a group of 13 New England fishing vessels seeking refuge in Port Roseway, Shelburne, Nova Scotia. Despite being outnumbered, Lowe boldly raised his Jolly Roger flag, sending a clear message that no mercy would be shown to those who dared to resist. Faced with this intimidating display, the fleet surrendered, and Lowe's men pillaged every vessel. Among them, Lowe handpicked the largest, an 80-ton schooner, which he christened the Fancy. 
Equipped with ten cannons, this ship became his prized flagship. As for the rest of the fleet, Lowe sunk them to ensure no trace of their existence remained, leaving behind only the abandoned Rebecca. The ab After acquiring his new flagship, the Fancy, Lowe and his fleet continued their plundering spree, seizing numerous sloops. Among the captured vessels was one that Lowe personally claimed, christening it the Fortune. However, their reign of terror would eventually face legal repercussions. During a trial held on July 10, 1723, several members of Lowe's crew stood before the court. It was during this trial that a sailor aboard the Fortune, named John Welland, provided a harrowing account of his experience. Welland testified that Lowe not only stripped his boat bare, including gold worth 150 pounds, but also subjected him to a brutal assault. Lowe mercilessly beat Welland, and using a cutlass, severed his ear. As the year 1723 unfolded in the Caribbean, the authorities could no longer tolerate the reign of terror orchestrated by Edward Lowe and his crew. Determined to put an end to his crimes, a force was dispatched to swiftly deal with the notorious pirate. On June 10th, Lowe's fleet suffered a crushing defeat at the hands of English Captain Peter Solgard and his formidable warship, the HMS Greyhound. In the fierce battle, many of Lowe's crew members perished. Despite the loss, Lowe and a skeleton crew from the Fancy managed to escape the clutches of their pursuers. In the following year, Lowe's actions grew even more brutal towards the ships he captured. However, this reign of terror would come to an abrupt halt when his crew mutinied against him, leaving him abandoned and marooned. Lowe is today remembered as one of the most notorious pirates that ever lived. Number 4. Robert Bart During the golden age of piracy, Bartholomew Roberts, a Welshman, emerged as the most successful pirate of the era, plundering over 400 ships, earning him the posthumous moniker of Black Bart. Roberts showed no discrimination in his piracy, targeting vessels regardless of their nationality, with a particular focus on those involved in the transatlantic slave trade. His flagship, the Royal Fortune, boasted an intimidating crew of 200 men and 40 cannons. After assuming the role of captain, Bartholomew Roberts wasted no time in taking action. His first order of business was to lead his crew back to Principe Island, seeking vengeance for the death of Captain Davis. Under the cover of darkness, they descended upon the island, mercilessly slaughtering a significant number of the male population and looting any valuable items they could carry. This ruthless act set the tone for Roberts' piratical endeavors. In the days that followed, Roberts and his crew captured a Dutch guinea man, and shortly thereafter, a British ship named Experiment. The pirate ship resupplied and replenished its provisions at Anambo. It was during this time that a crucial decision had to be made. Should they set sail for the East Indies or head to Brazil? After a vote among the crew, the majority favored Brazil as their next destination. The audaciousness and success displayed by Roberts during these early exploits solidified the loyalty of most of his crew. They recognized his bravery and remarkable achievements, deeming him pistol-proof. They believed that remaining under his command would yield substantial gains and opportunities. Roberts's leadership skills, combined with his daring exploits and knack for success, earned him the respect and allegiance of his crew. Little did they know that they were embarking on a journey that would etch their names into the annals of piracy history. While Roberts's ship was armed like a warship, his most infamous heist showcased his cunning rather than overt violence. The Royal Fortune encountered a Portuguese treasure fleet off the coast of Brazil, awaiting the protection of men of war to accompany them to Lisbon, a precaution taken due to the significant risks involved in transporting riches across the Atlantic. Roberts's audacious act of piracy unfolded with subtlety as he initially blended in with the convoy. He identified the ship carrying the most valuable loot and ordered his crew to attack and board it before the Portuguese could fully comprehend the gravity of the situation. Estimates suggest that the haul included anywhere from 40,000 to 90,000 gold coins, along with intricate jewelry intended for the King of Portugal. While Robert's acts of brutality were numerous, this daring and lucrative raid stands out as one of his most renowned exploits. However, despite his successes, 
Roberts met his ultimate defeat when his ship was unexpectedly invaded by a British vessel. Interestingly, Roberts himself was known for his teetotalism and Christian beliefs, setting him apart from the stereotypical image of a pirate. Nonetheless, his career as a formidable pirate captain came to an end on that fateful day. Black Bart possessed distinctive physical features and a penchant for flamboyant attire that contributed to his legendary status as a pirate. One notable characteristic was his thick black hair, which led to the moniker Black Bart, or Barty DDU. He took pride in his appearance and was often seen dressed in vibrant and colorful clothing. Roberts had a preference for red breeches and jackets, which made him stand out among his crewmates. One intriguing accessory that Roberts was known to wear was a flamingo feather in his hat. The reasons behind this choice remain speculative, but it added to his flamboyant image and distinct style. Some suggest that his flamboyant attire, including the red outfit, served as a way to disguise any bloodstains resulting from battle wounds. It's also possible that Roberts deliberately sought attention and recognition rather than trying to remain anonymous. Given his reputation as one of the most famous pirates of his time, he may have relished the fame and attention that came with his exploits. In addition to his colorful attire, Roberts adorned himself with notable jewelry. One prominent piece was a large diamond cross, which was said to have originally belonged to the King of Portugal. This extravagant accessory further added to his distinctive appearance and showcased his audacity in flaunting such a valuable item. Back in the day, the infamous pirate Roberts had a clever idea. He introduced pirate medical insurance for his crew, ensuring they were compensated for combat injuries. This intriguing piece of history was chronicled by British Captain Charles Johnson, rumored to be none other than Daniel Defoe, in his 1724 book titled A General History of the Robberies of the Most Notorious Pirates. According to the records, losing a right arm would earn a hefty compensation of 800 pounds, while a severed left arm would result in a slightly lower payment of 700 pounds, often paid in pieces of eight, the stolen currency from Spanish galleons. Roberts, with his impressive list of successful captures, started to feel invincible. However, in the early 1720s, urgent concerns arose in the Houses of Parliament in London. Britain heavily relied on its trading routes, particularly the triangular trade involving West Africa, the Caribbean, and Europe. This meant that pirates like Roberts posed a threat that needed to be dealt with. The strategy of allowing unchecked piracy to undermine Spanish and Portuguese dominance was no longer compatible with British expansion. As Roberts continued to disrupt British trade, the Royal Navy became increasingly determined to track him down. In 1722, off the coast of Benin, West Africa, Roberts' ship, the Royal Fortune, was confronted by His Majesty's Swallow. Despite Robert's reputation as the most prolific pirate of the time and the favorable conditions outlined in the Pirate Code, including the provision of medical insurance, his force consisted of four ships and several hundred men. However, the Royal Navy's firepower was superior and Robert suffered a fatal throat wound, leading to his surrender. Robert's famous motto, a merry life and a short one, was often quoted and seemed fitting. His death was seen by many as the end of the golden age of piracy. Additionally, 52 members of his crew were hanged, making a powerful statement that resonated throughout the trading triangle. Number 3. Francis Spriggs The early life of Francis Spriggs is shrouded in mystery, but his path to infamy began as the quartermaster under Captain Edward Lowe. Together, they inflicted cruel and unusual punishments on unfortunate victims who fell into their clutches. Spriggs, harboring a desire to captain his ship, saw an opportunity in December of 1724. Lowe had temporarily given him command of a captured British man of war, but after an argument, Spriggs betrayed his captain, slipping away under the cover of darkness with the ship, intending to forge his path. He headed for the West Indies, where he unleashed a reign of terror on any merchant vessels unlucky enough to cross his path. However, it was with the capture of a Portuguese ship in 1725 that Spriggs truly showcased his terrifying nature. After looting the ship, the traumatized crew endured a bizarre torture known as the Sweats. 
Candles were placed around the main mast, forming a circle of pirates armed with sharp implements. One by one, the captured crew members were forced to enter the circle while a violin played a merry tune, and the ordeal began. The victims ran around the mast while the pirates viciously poked and prodded their exposed flesh. The slower the victim moved, the deeper the wounds would be inflicted. Once the ordeal ended, the exhausted and wounded men may have thought the worst was over, but Spriggs was not known for mercy. He promptly set the ship on fire with the prisoners still on board, condemning them to a fiery death as he and his crew watched with glee from a safe distance. Spriggs' penchant for unusual tortures was further demonstrated when, in 1724, he considered seeking a royal pardon for his crimes. As a gesture of goodwill, he released a group of prisoners to the authorities. However, upon closer examination, it was discovered that the prisoners were covered in various wounds and injuries. Some even spoke of being forced to eat plates of hot wax by the deranged Spriggs. Unsurprisingly, the royal pardon never materialized. These tortures, along with Spriggs's disregard for human life, struck fear into the merchant crews operating in the Caribbean waters. Returning to the Bay of Honduras, Spriggs's audacity knew no bounds. He captured an impressive 10 to 12 English vessels before being chased off by a British man of war. Seeking a brief respite, he found refuge in South Carolina before setting his sights once again on the Bay of Honduras. There, he continued his plundering spree, seizing an additional 16 vessels. However, his luck began to wane as he once again encountered the same British warship that had pursued him before. Despite the close call, Spriggs managed to evade capture, but his fleet disintegrated when he and Shipton became separated. During this time, Spriggs's quartermaster, Philip Line, seized the prize ship Sea Nymph and set sail for Newfoundland, leaving Spriggs behind. Details regarding Spriggs's later career are scarce, but newspaper accounts suggest that he remained active in the region. As of April 1725, he was reportedly responsible for capturing several more ships, leaving a trail of fear and destruction in his wake. The full extent of Spriggs's subsequent exploits and ultimate fate, however, remains shrouded in mystery. Unlike other pirates who cultivated a fearsome image for strategic purposes, Spriggs and his men operated more like roving barbarians, showing little subtlety or care for the suffering they caused. As their fame grew, so did the attention of the Royal Navy, eager to crack down on piracy and protect trade between the old and new worlds. British warships armed to the teeth continually harassed Spriggs throughout the Caribbean, but he managed to evade capture time and again, continuing to terrorize the shipping lanes. By 1726, his activities dwindled, and his ultimate fate remained unconfirmed. According to a newspaper article, there is a strange twist of fate suggesting that Spriggs may have ended up marooned on the same island as Edward Lowe, the pirate captain he had betrayed two years earlier. Another interesting newspaper account from the Post Boy dated June 25, 1726. It seems that the pirate Spriggs was still active around that time. The report mentions that Spriggs, along with the notorious pirate Edward Lowe and another pirate named Shipton, were marooned on an island. In today's subscriber's pick, the air is startled with pictures of the thick, tangled Blackbeard and the weird-looking Francois Olonnet. These two were very much dreaded in the golden age that mere mention of their names could make a sailor pee. For Francois, it's as if his eye holds the secret of the countless treasures he plundered during his notorious career. And for Blackbeard, the scars on his face hint at the numerous battles he has fought. What makes these duo the devil of the deep blue sea is deeper than our mind can imagine, but we'll tell you everything you need to know about them and more in this video. Every of their ruthless expedition is captured and you can't wait to shudder in disbelief at what these humans turn to. Please, check out the comment section and drop what you think about these pirates. Now we know the answer to that. Do we not? Mutineers! Number 2. Francois Lolonnais. Francois Lolonnais was a notorious French pirate from the 17th century. He was indeed a dreaded pirate known for his extreme acts of violence against the Spanish. Born in France, Francois Lolonnais was initially indentured into servitude and brought to the Caribbean. After completing his servitude, 
he became a buccaneer, a state-sponsored pirate authorized by the French government to raid Spanish ships. He quickly gained a reputation for his brutality and became a feared enemy of the Spanish. One notable event in Francois Lolonais's career occurred when he and his crew were shipwrecked and ambushed by Spanish soldiers. To survive, he covered himself in the blood of his dead comrades and dragged their corpses on top of him to conceal himself. He managed to escape, donning the clothes of a dead Spanish soldier. Seeking revenge on the Spanish, Francois Lolonais captured a Spanish warship and beheaded the entire crew except for one survivor, whom he sent back with a warning that he would show no mercy to any Spaniard he encountered. He built a fleet of ships and attacked Spanish towns along the Venezuelan coast, inflicting brutal tortures on residents to extract information about hidden valuables. In 1666, the infamous pirate Lolonais set sail from Tortuga with a formidable fleet, ready to plunder the city of Maracaibo in modern-day Venezuela. Teaming up with fellow buccaneer Michel Labasque, Lolonais intercepted a Spanish treasure ship, seizing its precious cargo of cocoa beans, gemstones, and a staggering 260 Spanish dollars. Undeterred by the seemingly impregnable San Carlos de la Barra fortress guarding the entrance to Lake Maracaibo, Lolonais devised a daring plan. He attacked the fortress from its vulnerable landward side, swiftly overpowering it and gaining access to the city. Maracaibo's residents had fled, hiding their gold, but Lolonais and his ruthless crew hunted them down, using brutal torture methods to extract the hidden treasures. They pillaged the city, demolishing defensive walls and seizing the fort's cannons. Notorious for his expertise in torture, Lolonais employed horrifying techniques such as sword-slicing flesh, burning victims alive, and using knotted ropes to inflict excruciating pain. Over the following months, Lolonais and his crew continued their reign of terror, pillaging and burning much of Maracaibo before setting their sights on San Antonio de Gibraltar. Despite being outnumbered, they mercilessly slaughtered 500 soldiers and held the city for ransom. Even after receiving a substantial payment, Lolonais continued his rampage, amassing a hoard of 260,000 pieces of eight, along with gems, silverware, silks, and enslaved individuals. News of his ferocity and cruelty spread, earning him the infamous moniker, the Bane of Spain. Lolonais' audacious exploits left a lasting mark on pirate history, forever cementing his name as one of the most ruthless and feared pirates of the seas. After capturing Puerto Cavallo during one of his raids, and while en route to San Pedro, Lolonais was ambushed by a large force of Spanish soldiers. In a desperate attempt to extract information about an alternative route, he resorted to a horrific act. According to Alexandre Exquemelin, a contemporary writer and former pirate, Lolonais drew his cutlass and cut open the chest of one of the captured Spaniards. He then pulled out the man's heart and proceeded to bite and gnaw on it with his teeth, like a ravenous wolf. The intention behind this gruesome act was to intimidate the remaining prisoners into revealing information. This incident, along with other acts of extreme violence and cruelty, contributed to Lolonais's fearsome reputation as a pirate. His actions were intended to instill terror in his enemies and deter resistance. However, it's important to note that historical accounts of piracy often contain sensationalized or exaggerated details, and some aspects of the story may be embellished or distorted over time. Despite accumulating wealth and fame, Francois Lolonais did not retire, but embarked on further expeditions. However, his fortunes eventually turned when he was ambushed by a large Spanish force in Central America. During the battle, he interrogated captured Spanish soldiers about a lightly guarded route to a settlement. When they refused to comply, he reportedly cut open the chest of one prisoner, tore out his still beating heart, and bit into it before threatening the remaining prisoners. After suffering further misfortunes and capture by a cannibalistic native tribe near Panama, Francois Lolonais met a brutal end. The tribe tore his body apart, cooked it over an open fire, and devoured him. It is worth noting that while Francois Lolonais' reputation for brutality is well documented, some of the more extreme and gory details of his actions may be exaggerated or subject to embellishment over time. Number 1. Blackbeard Truly, the story of historical pirates will not be complete without Blackbeard. 
Edward Teach, also known as Blackbeard, was an English pirate who operated in the West Indies and along the eastern coast of Britain's North American colonies. While little is known about his early life, it is believed that he may have served as a sailor on privateer ships during Queen Anne's War. He eventually settled on the Bahamian island of New Providence, which served as a base for Captain Benjamin Hornigold, whose crew teach joined around 1716. After being placed in command of a captured sloop by Captain Hornigold, Teach eventually acquired a frigate, believed to be the stolen ship Concord, which had been renamed La Concorde by French privateers who used it as a slave ship. Teach took possession of the ship and renamed it Queen Anne's Revenge, which became his flagship vessel. With Queen Anne's Revenge, Blackbeard sailed to the Caribbean and captured numerous ships, expanding his fleet and accumulating wealth. The ship was armed with 40 guns and manned by a crew of around 300, making it a formidable force. In 1718, Blackbeard intentionally scuttled Queen Anne's Revenge near Charleston, North Carolina, and transferred his crew to a smaller sloop named Adventure. In 1996, the remains of Queen Anne's Revenge were discovered offshore of Atlantic Beach in North Carolina. The identification of the ship was aided by the recovery of coins bearing the likeness of Queen Anne and King George I. Over more than 10 years of excavations and underwater archaeological digs, divers have recovered an impressive array of artifacts from the ship, including cannons from various European countries such as Sweden, England, and France. Many of these items are now housed at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. The recovery and study of these artifacts have provided valuable insights into the life and operations of Blackbeard and his crew. Blackbeard's flag, known as the Jolly Roger, depicted a skeleton stabbing a heart with a spear while holding a glass in its other hand, seemingly toasting the devil. The flag symbolized the danger that Blackbeard and his crew represented and their purported alliance with the devil. This choice of flag was yet another tactic employed by Blackbeard to strike fear into the hearts of those who encountered him, serving as a warning sign and a reminder of the ruthless pirates they were facing. The combination of Blackbeard's fearsome appearance, the tales of his brutal actions, and the symbolism of his flag all contributed to the aura of terror that surrounded him, making him one of the most infamous and feared pirates of his time. Teach's most notable achievement was the capture of a French slave ship called La Concorde, which he renamed Queen Anne's Revenge. He equipped the ship with 40 guns and assembled a crew of over 300 men. Blackbeard's fearsome reputation stemmed from his thick black beard and intimidating appearance. He reportedly tied lit fuses, known as slow matches, under his hat to create an intimidating effect. Blackbeard formed alliances with other pirates and blockaded the port of Charleston, South Carolina, holding its inhabitants for ransom. He eventually ran Queen Anne's Revenge aground near Beaufort, North Carolina. He then separated from Steed Bonnet and settled in Bath, North Carolina, where he accepted a royal pardon. However, he returned to piracy soon after. On November 22, 1718, the confrontation between Blackbeard and Lieutenant Robert Maynard took place off the coast of Ocracoke Island. Governor Alexander Spotswood of Virginia had assembled a private pirate hunting force, which included the ships HMS Pearl and HMS Lime under Maynard's command. Maynard and his forces located Blackbeard and his crew on Ocracoke Island and positioned themselves to block all possible escape routes. They entered the inlet in the hope of surprising Blackbeard and his men. However, Blackbeard spotted the approaching ships and immediately cut his anchor, launching an attack with his cannons. In a matter of seconds, he managed to destroy a third of Maynard's force. As the ships closed in, both sides engaged in close quarters combat. Grappling hooks, smoke, and explosive grenades were thrown, and the pirates boarded Maynard's ship. Unbeknownst to the pirates, Maynard had hidden the majority of his troops below deck, preparing to ambush the pirate boarders. The ambush succeeded, overwhelming the pirates. During the battle, Blackbeard and Maynard reportedly engaged in a personal fight, using pistols and swords. It is said that Blackbeard was wounded by one of Maynard's soldiers and then faced the rest of the crew, who overpowered him. After the battle, it was discovered that Blackbeard had been shot at least five times and sustained over 20 blade wounds. 
The exact cause of his death remains uncertain due to the extent of his injuries. Blackbeard's severed head was hung from the mast of Maynard's ship as a grisly trophy, and all but two of the captured pirates were eventually hanged. The log entry from Lieutenant Maynard's journal on January 3, 1719, described his arrival in Virginia from North Carolina aboard the Adventure Sloop, which had previously been under the command of the pirate Edward Teach. Maynard notes that he hung Teach's head under the bowsprit of the ship and delivered the captured pirate's goods and effects for distribution. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.